Donc nous allons commencer tout de suite par Benoît, qui va nous parler des systèmes de paiement et de l'argent. Donc Benoît, c'est à toi. Merci François. Euh, bon après-midi à tous. Et je vais parler en anglais, si vous le voulez bien. So good afternoon from Basel, and I, uh, my, my sincere apologies for not being able to join you uh, in person uh, in Abu Dhabi. But uh, I get the fact that part of us is uh, present and part of us is on the screen is also a, a good illustration of the, uh, the way the world works today. Uh, there are many ways in which COVID-19 uh, has changed the world, uh, and, and more specifically how COVID-19 has uh, accelerated the digital transformation. But uh, finance uh, is, a, uh, is one of them. Uh, and uh, I think what's going on now in finance bears useful lessons uh, for the, uh, if we want to think about the, uh, the future world. So I'm going to spend a few minutes on that. Um, and uh, I think it's fair to say that the pandemic uh, has uh, started the third stage in you know, a transformation of money and payments, which had started a few years ago. The first stage of this transformation was about uh, the, uh, the consumer experience, or what technicians would call the front end of payment system. That is payment interfaces, mobile payments, um, all kind of uh, new ways to, um, to, uh, to pay at the point of sale, QR codes, uh, and so on. Uh, and that's not new, and we're all doing it every day now. Um, but uh, that was that was exciting, new, good for consumers, but it didn't change in a fundamental way the way payment works. Money uh, continued to be shipped from one point to another, domestically and uh, internationally, uh, through banks. And when it comes to cross-border payments, through correspondent banks, uh, and uh, and through the big systems that uh, central banks have put in place, which we call, uh, in our jargon, the... Uh, RTGS systems, real-time growth settlement systems, which are the, uh, the big pipelines that channel money from one place to another and from one bank to another. And that was the first stage. And in the second stage, we've seen emerging uh, what I would call closed loop payment systems, um, which um, in many ways uh, are outside the reach of, uh, of public authorities and central banks, uh, and uh, which bear the promise of uh, decentralization of shortcutting a number of these processes, which I've just highlighted. And this started with crypto, of course, but then crypto uh, turned out a, a disappointment in terms of, of payments because crypto proved to be very volatile. Um, it might be a proposition in terms of investment. And even with, with, with that, it comes with lots of risks and, uh, and, and issues that I'm not going to discuss here, uh, money laundering, uh, investor protection, and so on. But I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, Lots of cryptos are, are I mean, cryptos are not used as, as payment instruments any longer, uh, by and large. And then we had this new concept, which we call a stablecoin, uh, which is basically a cryptocurrency backed by uh, safe assets or even backed by fiat money, uh, which uh, which started emerging. And a well-known example is the Facebook's project uh, Libra, which is now called DM. That was a couple of years ago, uh, and and this was the second stage of a revolution in. in in the sense that uh, it, uh, uh, it, uh, it, the proposition was that payment systems uh, would be, um, as I said, in closed loops. It would be walled gardens that would be either decentralized, fully decentralized, or uh, controlled by uh, single companies, which in most cases would be big tech companies. So companies with a lot of market power uh, and uh, a lot of uh, opportunities to, um, to create positive uh, network effects but also the risk of excessive market power and the risk of um, confusion or even conflict of interest in the way a personal data would be used across the, across, the, uh, across the system. So that came with both promises for the consumer, but also uh, new risks. Um, and so what's going to happen now and what, 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 what should be the mission brief of public authorities for the, for the third stage of the pandemic, after the pandemic? Um, this is a matter of concern for public authorities because money is an attribute of sovereignty and because money is a key instrument of, uh, of economic policy. So you want to keep, as a, as a government, as a central bank, you want to keep the possibility to use monetary policy, to use liquidity provision uh, in case of a crisis, right, to stabilize the system. And also you want to make sure, you want to make sure that money is trusted. So 
So you need a number of regulations and uh, and conditions on the system to ensure that uh, money will be trusted by citizens, which is also the key uh, uh, expectations of society. So there are, there are different answers to what's going on now. One first answer will be through regulation. And it's very clear that there are large parts of uh, decentralized finance, as we know it today, uh, which will need uh, tighter regulation. And maybe some of it will disappear because it will be regulated. And because the, uh, the business proposition now is precisely not to be regulated. And what remains uh, can be very useful, but it has to be properly regulated. Um, either as a uh, as payment system or as a uh, market infrastructure or as, uh, as investment vehicle. Uh, and then uh, public authorities will also uh, see good reasons to uh, issue their own digital assets uh, that they want to put at the heart of the system to um, deliver the key public policy functions that are today delivered uh, by central bank money. So there is nothing new here. But we just want to keep that possibility in a di digital world. So imagine a crisis like uh, what we've seen in March 2020. Central banks had to provide a lot of liquidity to stabilize markets, to stabilize the global system, and you want it to be possible also in a digital world. And for that, you may need central bank digital currency. That is a new form of, of money. My last con my last point, uh, which I think matters for this conference, is about international cooperation. There are good reasons why international cooperation is needed around this discussion. One reason is that the financial system is global and we want to keep it that way. Uh, we want our workers in Europe, in the US, or here in Abu Dhabi to keep shipping money uh, to their family back home. That's called remittances and it, this has to be uh, possible also in the digital world. We want the system to work as a system. Second reason is that some of the players are global players. Uh, and that's particularly the case for big tech companies. So you will need international coordination on the way uh, they, uh, you want to regulate uh, these big tech companies when they step into finance, when they start providing financial services. Um, and um, when, uh, I think one, one last reason is that it just saves time and money to do things together, to experiment together, to build together, which is uh, the essence of what my group is doing in Basel, the innovation we built there to uh, convene central banks and provide them with a platform where they can test new technology. Uh, but there are, we, I think we should, uh, we should not fool ourselves and there are powerful forces acting against co international cooperation in this field. First, because money, as I said, is an attribute of sovereignty. So at the end, that's something to be decided nationally. And second, because we are talking of technology and we, as we know very well, today's wars are technological wars. And uh, there is a risk that competition on technology uh, would create disruption in this new world of finance or would, would create like, additional fragmentation in the world that is already getting fragmented. So the question I would like to throw in the discussion, and I will stop with that, is how do we carve out a, a safe space uh, when we can keep making the global financial system safe and stable in spite of uh, technological tensions and technological wars? And that question will become increasingly important in the future, and I stop here. Merci, Benoît, pour ton, ton introduction, qui va, j'imagine, donner de l'imagination et du cœur à ce débat.